Good morning. Today, uh, we're going to keep rolling through this Next Step series. As you saw on the screen, shoulder to shoulder, we're going to be talking about discipleship. We're going to be talking about uh, the fact that we get to walk this out together and as well take a real deep look at what that looks like as a disciple. Uh, we've been working our way through these different values that we have here at VNC. A couple weeks ago, we talked about community and the avenue that we have here with life groups. Uh, we also spent last week just talking about the value of us gathering together in this place, not, not just to worship, but as well to serve. And today we're going to talk about another uh, important value in the reality of discipleship here at VNC. Now, all of them are rooted in our mission statement. You'll see it on the screen, helping people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That gave birth to our vision statement. And you'll see that on the screen as well. Meet people exactly where they're at and help them navigate the next steps in their spiritual journey. Well, along the way, if you've been here around VNC, you've heard us as well use the an acronym of, of LED, uh, which stands for Leadership, Evangelism, and Discipleship. And those become sort of the avenue in which we can help these next steps unfold. And in particular today, we will be focusing on discipleship, and we're going to look at it at the foundational level uh, of what it means, but as well, we're going to get specific with it and tackle a particular area of discipleship. And uh, yeah, that's how we're going to dive in and go from there. Now, discipleship has been defined as, uh, for, me, for decades. I, I need to figure out who said this quote because it's been used so many times, but discipleship has been defined as long obedience moving in the same direction. So if that is the case, we see a lot of life on that journey. And if you think about it, you probably have seen some sweet spots. There's also been some times where you wrestled with God. Probably also have been some difficulties. But in all of that, you can still grow. You can still be a disciple following Jesus along the way. Now, sometimes discipleship means it, it's a call to action. Discipleship is us actually doing something. Sometimes discipleship is preparation. It's preparing us to do something. And there are times I honestly believe in discipleship where, where it's unfolding as you walk through your wounds and you walk through your pain. It's even in those moments, I don't believe God will let those things go to waste and he will bring beauty out of the ashes. And even in those moments, discipleship is taking place. Now around here, we use the phrase that true growth, when it comes to discipleship, true growth is both knowing and becoming, and we want to live in the tension of the two. And living in the tension isn't always easy. We can sometimes get so poured, pulled towards the knowing and the knowledge that, man, we can quote scripture left and right. We'll love debating theology with people. We love debating doctrine but we're not living out the action of following Jesus. We're not really focused in on the relationship with him. Or you can go the other end of the spectrum, and on that other end, we can get almost addicted to doing things that are good and, and that they would appear to be for the kingdom's work, but we have no idea how to actually be with the king. Usually if someone's on that end of the spectrum, they have a, a lack of biblical knowledge, and in fact, they're lacking character because they don't live a transformed life in the wholeness of, of following Jesus. I love how Mike Breen puts it. He says it this way. He goes, we can't replace the power of a life lived with God for the emotions we get from doing things for God. Let me read that again. We can't replace the power of a life lived with God for the emotions we get from doing things for God. Part of our discipleship journey as a tribe together here at VNC, some of the next steps that we take together is to live in the tension of both. We want to have the knowledge, and we also want to become. We want to know and become. We want to live in the tension of those two. And though we believe when we live in that tension, God shapes us. He transforms our lives. Now, today in particular, let's really dig into discipleship in one particular area. And as we take a look at this area, sometimes you're either going to love it or hate it, but we're going to talk about a part of discipleship that, that I think matters. And as we do that, I want us to ask the question, what am I doing? For some of you, it may be a very desperate question of what am I doing. For some of us, it may just be very retrospective and just going, all right, in the scheme of following Jesus, what am I doing? But today, we're going to talk about obedience. And, and I had to wrestle with this a little bit, uh, just getting everything ready for, for this weekend. And, and I worked myself through a series of questions. I don't know if you talk to yourself, 
I, I sometimes do that. Sometimes it's prayer, sometimes it's conversation with God, sometimes it's conversation with my own noggin. But I had to ask myself some questions, and I had to say, okay, why do you want to talk about obedience? What is the deal that you feel like you should talk about obedience in, in the realm of discipleship today? What does that have to do with shoulder to shoulder and walking this out? What, what is all that? How does that matter? Well, my answer to the why was, I think it matters. I think it genuinely matters for followers of Jesus to talk about obedience. And so then I had to ask the question again, why? Okay, why does it matter? Why, if you think it so matters that much, why does it matter? And, and so I had to wrestle with that one and, and go, okay, what is it, God, that, that not only you're speaking to my heart, but maybe you speak to someone else? And it, it came down to this thought of, okay, I, I really want people to grasp that our obedience is a loving response to God's love. I mean, at the heart of our obedience, it is this loving response to God's love. So then I had to ask the why again. Well, why do you, why does it matter so much that people would know that their obedience is a loving response to God's love? And for one, I, I, I was honest and just was like, okay, I think my answer to that why would be, I, I see many people walking in disobedience and because I love and care, I want to point that out to them just in case they don't know. But there's also another side of that because I grew up, uh, great church, great family. Um, I mean, we had our hills and valleys like everyone else, but I grew up with a legalistic mindset, trying to earn God's love. And when I want to speak about obedience, I want people to understand that their obedience that's rooted in anything other than love is probably going to leave them miserable. So as a follower of Jesus, living in that tension of both knowing and becoming, and, and let's using those thoughts to talk about obedience, realizing we walk this journey out together, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, let's dive into the scriptures. First John chapter 2. And we'll spend some time looking uh, at, at different letters that John wrote, well, one gospel and a letter that John wrote, and we're going to learn from uh, his perspective, his writing, and some of the words of Jesus as well. Chapter 2, 1 John, verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Let's go back. Let's work sort of through this verse by verse and, and, and take it apart and, and see what God may want to speak to our hearts about. But let's go back to verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. It's interesting that he would imply that there is evidence to yourself that I can know, that I truly know him, that I am a disciple, that I am following Jesus, by my own obedience, that the obedience becomes evidence that you are genuinely in a relationship with God. At the heart of the scriptures is the greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that in itself encompasses so much territory and ground in your life, but it's in that very thing that we have evidence that we truly know him. And I really do believe that when we are responding with obedience, with love, to his love, I really think that's a sign of spiritual maturity. I mean, um, kids were growing up when we began to operate in obedience to what God has called us to do. I think you could take the flip side of that to be true as well. If we are constantly disobedient, consistently disobedient or having no regard for God's word and his commands and his scripture, that would be evidence that we are under the influence of, of sin and that we know sin more than we know God. Let's look at verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. Now, I, many theologians would suggest that this is sort of um, John throwing a quick jab because the reason he was writing this letter was because uh, the people he was writing to were dealing with some false teaching. And he was addressing some of those issues. So it's in essence a jab at those false teachers, but as well as to anyone who was pretending to be following Jesus when really they weren't. 
Then you know what I mean? The, 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 the image of a person who would have the, the right look or the right words. They would know all the Christian cliches to use, but they were still living under the power of sin. You see, the reality of following Jesus is once you have a relationship with Jesus, our relationship with sin changes. If it's not changing, we're probably not following Jesus. There is going to be a change because Christ lives within you, because there is something powerful going on within your life. And, and it, some of the changes you might see is we, you just you won't love the sin that comes to your mind like you used to. You won't plan to sin like you used to. Some of the desires of our heart, God will be at work changing, and so those desires will be transformed. Let's look at verse 5 and 6. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Is it possible we like Jesus as a savior, but we don't want him to be our role model? Is it possible we love him as a savior, but we really don't want him to be our role model? If I take these words to heart from this scripture, then uh, he's got to be my role model. I mean, look at the end of the verse 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Jesus lived a life of obedience to God, devotion to God. He was obedient to the leading of God in his life. His life was characterized by love. He was the real deal. He gave us this example, and now we are to follow in those footsteps. Now, I think sometimes we want to follow in his footsteps when it sounds like we get to walk on water. But maybe we're supposed to follow his footsteps in just the every day to day part of life. That we would allow this life of Christ to so invade ours that it's seen in every part of our life fully and wholly. And, and you want to, okay, how do you, how do you do that? Let's talk practical for a few minutes. Um, get into this. And I want you to go through the gospels. That would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They talk a lot about Jesus. And you get to you get to read about Jesus' words. You get to see his actions. You get to see how he responded to different things. And what if you, you, you went through those and literally put a notebook or used your computer, whatever it may be, and you, you wrote notes and said, okay, I'm going to write down how Jesus spoke about these things. I'm going to write down his actions. I'm going to write down everything I can. How do you deal with temptation? How did he love one another? How did he function with money? How did he deal with people? How did he deal with his enemies? What did Jesus what did Jesus do in every situation? Write them down. And then look at your life and go, okay, am I seeing similarities in the way that I'm living my life with Jesus? And, and if you are, celebrate that and know that he's going to continue to bring about more change so you are more and more like Jesus. And if you're not seeing any similarities, just talk to him and say, okay, I want to see more similarities in my life because God will empower you and he will be at work in your life to bring those similarities to Jesus to life if you'll just ask him and turn to him. How cool would it be to live a life where people who would spend time with you would walk away knowing that they've spent time with somebody who's walking in the footsteps of Jesus, who's walking with Jesus. I want you to go back to John chapter 15. These are the words of Jesus as he gives this imagery. Uh, it's, it's, if, you've, if you've been around church, you've heard this before. It's the branches and the vine, Okay. And we'll, we'll dive into it in a second. Uh, it's sort of, you sort of wonder what kind of setting was going on when this conversation started up. Were they walking by a vineyard and that's how Jesus decided to go, hey, let's, let's talk about this. Or, or was they, did they walk by just somebody's single vine and branches? Or, or was it at the end of the Last Supper and as they were getting up from the table, he began that kind of conversation? Because what, part of what would have been interesting is the idea of the branches and the vine we read about in the Old Testament. It references Israel. You can look at it in the Psalms. David wrote about it. The prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah would reference the idea of Israel being the vine and the people were the, the branches. So the concept itself wasn't new to them. But the difference is Jesus is saying Israel's not the vine. I am. So that was a profound statement within itself. But with also think about the profound imagery that this gives to us. When you think about a branch off of a vine, that branch is completely dependent and constantly connected to the vine. 
That's a pretty powerful image. For that branch to live, for that branch to function, for that branch to, to be what it's supposed to be, it must be completely dependent and constantly connected to the vine. Let's look at Jesus' words. Chapter 15, verse 1. I am, this is Jesus talking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If we go back and look at those first two verses, I, I, love, man, I love the words right there in verse 1 I, where Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. God is right in the mix of all this, taking care of everything, the vine and the branches. But then it gets a little awkward for us, doesn't it? Verse 2, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. If a branch is unfruitful, it's removed. Now, in this room, I know we have some different theological thoughts on, on, on different aspects of following Jesus, and that's part of being a church that's sort of got a melting pot element to it, but we, we look at it in different ways. Some people see it as a metaphor that at the end of life, if, if we've um, produce no fruit, they would say that you weren't really saved, that the metaphor is the realities of heaven and hell that Scripture speaks clearly about, that we would be cut off and removed. There are other theological thoughts that would say, well, no, when you look at it, the reference is more about uh, this idea that uh, the, the branch started in faith, or the branch started in faith on the vine, but however, it was... Um, well, it was removed because it rejected following in Jesus' footsteps. It rejected being a disciple. It had no fruit in its life. Uh, ultimately, we're, we're going to go back to living in the tension here because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time just on debating the theology of it and have us miss the actual becoming part of it because the becoming part of it is when we read that sentence is to tell us we should be producing fruit. You and I should be producing fruit. You can debate the theology of that verse later on, on what it means when it says that it cuts someone off. But let's talk about the fact that we are to produce fruit in our lives. You can't escape that. Look at the rest of that verse, verse 2 again. So he cuts off every branch of me that bears no fr fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So if we don't bear fruit... You're, you're cut off. You're removed. If you bear fruit, there's two different, the, the same words used for pruning and cleansing. But when I think of pruning, I've, I've watched my wife go out into her little flower garden and prune. It looks just as painful to me as the cut off part. But when the pruning happens, we don't necessarily always like that, do we? That part doesn't necessarily... Uh, something we we'll always look forward to. We love the thought of, all right, I just want to pray this prayer and follow Jesus, but I just, I just want to pray the prayer. I don't want you getting involved in my life. I want this pruning to happen. But see, the pruning is removing anything that hinders your ability to produce more fruit. The pruning is the Holy Spirit at work in your life and making us more like Jesus. So we need to welcome the pruning. I love it in verse 3. Look at those words there again. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. We see that he used the word in their lives as part of the pruning process. What is his word speaking to you? Because in this word, there is, man, there's such great truth. There's conviction of sin and inspires obedience. There is the empowering that promotes growth. It's understanding who God is. But with the idea of pruning and cleansing, are you resisting God's pruning? Now, there are some aspects of his pruning that, that uh, I'm sorry, but you don't even get the choice to resist. It'll honestly come down to how are you responding in those moments. But there are some concepts in pruning that I think we could, well, we could resist. And when we think of pruning, I think we always think of these big sinful things and something over-the-top dynamics. But could it be that where his pruning is at work that we most often resist are with our attitudes or with the way we love one another? 
or within these realms of obedience that, that speak into our lives. And, and ultimately, if we're resisting that pruning, is it at its heart a trust issue? Do we not trust the gardener? The one who loves and cares for us, are we willing to trust him? Look at verse 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. We're not going to bear this kingdom spiritual fruit if we're not connected with the vine. And when you think about a branch, a branch takes on the very nature of the vine. I mean, it's nourished nourished by its sap. Its very life is lived through the life of the, of the vine. I mean, it is that amazing. So, so, and so he's saying, if you are remaining in me, there will be fruit. You can't avoid it. It is a part of following Jesus. And some of that fruit will be found in the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder life you walk out with other disciples. Sometimes the fruit in your life will be someone else's life as they follow Jesus. Now, the quality of this fruit may vary. There's a chance that the quality of the fruit in your life, when it comes to the spiritual side of following Jesus, when it just comes to living that out, five years ago, it's different quality than it is today. And who knows what kind of quality it will be five years from now. Or the quality of the fruit in your life may be different than the person sitting right next to you because you're at different points in the journey. The quantity of fruit in your life may change over the lifetime. That all of that, regardless of those thoughts, you're gonna produce fruit. A follower of Jesus connected to the vine will inevitably produce fruit. The fruit is seen in our actions, our attitudes, our character, our love, our nature that has been transformed by the Holy Spirit, it's in those things that God is at work. And so when he says to remain, when he says to remain in me, that's something we got to grab hold tight of then. We grab hold tightly because life is going to bring about trials. It's going to bring about pains. It's going to bring about temptation, and it will try to turn us away from God. So we've got to hold on tight to the truth of who he is. Now, what I love about, well, I don't know if I love it because it messes with me, but the word remain even in its sentence structure, implies that that's a choice you and I have to make. That you and I are going to have to make a choice to remain within his presence, within this truth. That will therefore impact our will. That will impact our decisions. You know, we talked earlier about the sweet spots or the wrestling with God. It's often in these moments where I think we do our most wrestling with God just so we can stay connected with him in the middle of that is deciding to do things repeatedly where you are trusting him and relying on him and staying connected to him. That's remaining in him. But don't miss a crucial part of this verse. As a follower of Jesus, as someone who is, man, you, you want to see fruit in your life and to see that change in character, see that change in our attitudes and our actions and in everything that unfolds in our life, to see that fruit to see all those things happen as a disciple, to obey and walk in obedience, don't miss out on an important part of verse 4. Look at that verse again. Chapter 15, verse 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. He doesn't set these incredibly unachievable things because what makes them achievable is he is that he's within you. He's within you. Recognize that this isn't just about you abiding in him, but it's believing and knowing that Christ is within you, that the Holy Spirit is within you. And when we remain in him and he is remaining in us, he helps us and he influences us with everything, with everything that we need to follow him. He will empower you to be obedient. He will help us be a disciple. That's a lot of love. That's a lot of love that's walking with you and I every step of the way to be a disciple who's obedient and fully trusting him. Maybe a goal in life as a follower of Jesus is to be confused with him someday. 
that the hours I spend with people, they would say, that, well, man, that was one of the closest things I've had to walking with Jesus. To where the front doors of this church are not those front doors, but it's our lives. Lived out in the day-to-day in those footsteps of Jesus, not necessarily walking on water, but walking through the dusty parts of life. That we would honor God with our obedience, that we would walk with Jesus and invite others to walk along the way and walk shoulder to shoulder with Jesus and with with each other. That we would make disciples, that we would be disciples, that we would go deep into scripture and, and obey the scriptures. You see, sometimes in all this talk and conversation, we get caught up with the word grace. And grace is a good thing. Now, grace is opposed to you and I earning God's love, but it's not opposed to effort. And earning, the idea of earning is this almost an entitlement issue, or it's honestly an ego issue, where you want to be in control and you want to do things to achieve this ability to be right with God. But grace, grace allows for there to be effort because effort is response, a response in love. Now, let's put it this way. If I had a swimming pool, I have a pool, I've paid for it, it's nice, it's pretty big, everybody can come, every last one of you can come to this pool that I have that I have fully paid for, and I am asking you to come to the pool. What do you assume we will be doing? Go ahead, tell me, what will we be doing? Swimming, all right, that's good. Now, some of you are gonna overanalyze this in the next few minutes. I already know how your brains work, because some of you are going, well, that depends on the temperature of the pool. Or you're going, I don't want all these people to see me in a swimsuit, or I'm not getting my hair wet. So for the sake of just making sure we understand the analogy, if I built, designed, and owned, and had a bowling alley, and I asked everyone to come to the bowling alley, what do you assume we would be doing? Very good. You all pass. And I didn't have too many comedians, so that's good. Jesus said, come and follow me. And he was able to say that because of this beautiful gift of salvation that was given to us through God, out of his love, through Jesus' death on the cross and the resurrection from the dead. And then Jesus says, come and follow me. So what do we assume we should do? You see, grace, grace gave us access to God. grace also empowers you to live it, to be a disciple. Let's go back to the swimming pool. Grace gives you access to the pool, and it empowers you to swim. Access to the pool costs you nothing. You can't earn it. But hear me, the invitation is to swim. That's the journey of being a disciple. The invitation in itself isn't just the pool. It's why the pool is there. It's to swim. You have access to the pool. You've been given an invitation to swim. Let's go back to that question I asked at the beginning. As a follower of Jesus, what are you doing? What are you doing? Using the swimming pool as our analogy, are you, are you sitting around the outside? Or are you in the pool? Are you swimming? Are you being a disciple? Swimming, obedience, loving God back, all of that happens when you're swimming, not by just sitting around the pool. Now, in this room, that swimming, that following Jesus, that obedience, that responding to his love with our love, that being a disciple probably looks very different 
Because some of y'all in your spiritual journey right now, you are that, you're the little kid holding on to the edge of the pool and kicking like crazy, trying to figure it out. Some of you are in the shallow end because you're afraid to go into the deep end right now, and that's okay. You'll get to the deep end. Some of you, you have discovered a lot of joy and the sweet spots in following Jesus. You're the, you're the goofball doing the cannonballs off the diving board, and you just can't get enough of it. Some of you have mastered the art of swimming. You are the Michael Phelps in all this, man. You are, you're cruising through the water, but there's still more to learn. There's still much more to grow. But the part that I want you to hear is you've been invited to swim, not just to come to the pool. The pool's there to swim. You've been invited to be a disciple of Jesus, to, to follow him. When he said, come follow me, we let that unfold in our lives. And in particular today, that means we operate in obedience. And we trust him. And we love him back with our obedience because of the love that he's shown us. You can't earn it, but you can respond to that love.